the third lecture. This would have been the third on the 28th of March, but as we were snowed out by last week's Nor'easter, the final lecture in the series has been rescheduled to April 12th, and you can, um, oh, thank you, there's the beeping thing, um, and you can register for that online. Uh, and before I begin, just a final note of thanks. We'll just wait for that to stop competing. Yeah, um, the final note of thanks is to Laura Minsky for, as usual, her flawless administration of this and all of our other research programs here. Excellent. <laughs> Timing's perfect. Last week, in the first, or two weeks ago, in the first of these lectures, Laura Liebman enjoined us to do or to seek out three things from her lecture. First, she uh, proposed or hoped that we would come to look at silver, the kinds of objects, material of the kinds of objects that she spoke about, look at it differently. She also asked us to, uh, to see about looking at gifts differently. Uh, and in the context of that lecture, uh, the emphasis was on what happens to gifts when they take on an intergenerational dimension, not you giving a gift to your best friend, but you giving a gift like the corny, but I guess appropriate Patek Philippe ads that <laughs> suggest that you never really own a gift, you just pass it on. Uh, sorry, Laura. Um, that was not a brand placement uh, comment either. <laughs> And finally, she urged us to think about the protagonist of that lecture um, in a different way, to think about the Jewish woman at the beginning of the 19th century and the way in which Jewish women's lives changed. I'd, uh, I'd add one further point, um, at least for me, thinking about the lecture with its very strong intergenerational dimension made me think that it was a, a silver beaker version of the hair with the amber eyes. Now, to that point about being challenged to think about how the world of the 19th century Jewish woman changed over time, and that dynamic is what we'll hear in these, uh, in these lectures, uh, we also engage with the question of what Jewish material culture is, and that's a question, I think, which all of us can pay attention to as we listen to tonight's lecture and the final one in the series. But there's also the meta question of whether, and this is germane to the project of this pilot program, really what's the value, not just what is Jewish material culture, but what is the value of studying? If there is a Jewish material culture, what is the value of it? And that's, uh, that's something, if I can quote one of the patron saints of history in the 20th century, Mark Bloch, who talked about the historian as an ogre with a taste for human blood. It's a little <laughs> gruesome, uh, but the point is that all things human, the smell of the human, the look of the human, the taste of the human, the footstep of the human, and that's one of the things perhaps that material culture gives us, the various ways of capturing the human. Uh, our professor, Laura Liebman, is professor of English and Humanities at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Her work focuses on religion and the daily lives of women and children in early America. She was trained as a scholar of uh, indigenous peoples, Native Americans, working on their oral traditions and culture. Her first book uh, focused on Indian converts, explo uh, exploring four generations of Native American when, uh, men, women, and children. And then she turned dramatically, and I suppose the secret of Laura's intellectual life may lie in the transition from the one to the other. Her second book, Messianism, Secrecy, and Mysticism, A New Interpretation of Early American Jewish Life, which published in 2012 was the winner uh, of many, many book prizes. Uh, she's edited volumes on Jews in the Americas from 1776 to 1826, and as we heard <laughs> last week, and we'll hear again, uh, part of the charm of the story of Jews in New York in the 19th century is their transnational character, uh, especially the dynamic of the Caribbean as it plays out in, in New York. The commenter uh, tonight is uh, Hasya Diner from NYU, one of the uh, Doyen of American Jewish History, winner of many prizes, uh, Guggenheim Fellowships, uh, Fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, in Princeton, Fellow of the American Academy of Jewish Research. 
the author of numerous prize-winning volumes, just to give you uh, a few of them. We Remember with Reverence and Love, American Jews and the Myth of Silence After the Holocaust, 1945 to 1962, winner of the National Jewish Book Award, among other awards. Jews of the United States, 1654 to 2000, Hungering for America, Italian, Irish, and Jewish Foodways in the Age of Migration, published 2002. Her works praise her, A History of Jewish Women in America from Colonial Times to the Present, 2002, and In the Almost Promised Land, American Jews and Blacks, 1915-1935, published in 1995. So uh, it's with that that I invite uh, Laura to the podium, and then uh, Professor Diener will follow with a comment. Thank you. On January 4th, 1942, as the United States perched on the cusp of World War II, Blanche Moses was sitting in her high quarters at 415 West 118th Street, New York, writing yet another letter to Rabbi Meyer, the librarian at American Jewish Historical Society. At 82, Blanche was losing her patience. Her collection of daguerreotypes, one of my most precious possessions, had been lost, and she was unable to get into the museum to look for them. She begged Rabbi Meyer for assistance. As she noted, she needed his help, as she preferred not to court personal publicity. This was something of an understatement. As the reclusive Blanche explained when giving the rabbi her number for her newly installed phone, she could be reached at any hour, day or evening, as I do not go out. Apparently, Rabbi Meyer was able to help Blanche because today the daguerreotypes form part of the Moses and Satius family papers at American Jewish Historical Society. The daguerreotypes included stiff portraits of Blanche's uncles in Civil War uniforms and Blanche's beautiful young mother, Selena Satius, in lacy fingerless gloves, all the rage in 1854. Her braided hair wound in heavy loops on the sides of her head like a Victorian Princess Leia. The daguerreotypes have been reunited with other family portraits, including portraits of Blanche's sister Edith in blonde ringlets and Blanche herself pouting with her dolls. When Blanche died in 1949, the photos and daguerreotypes, along with her family's other memorabilia, became part of the collection of the oldest ethnic historic society in the United States. In the elegant climate controlled building on West 16th, Blanche's collection nestles among the donations of other families eager to preserve the past. Today, genealogy is the second most popular hobby in the United States. However, few of us are as lucky as Blanche to have such an illustrious family to study. Among Blanche's possessions were items from her two famous great-grandfathers, the first, Reverend Gersha Mendez Satius, shown here on the right, was remembered as one of Sheriff Israel's most beloved spiritual leaders. The second, Isaac Moses, on the left, the husband of Raina from, last, from two weeks ago, was a real estate tycoon and a synagogue leader. Yet even Blanche would be surprised by recent interest in one of the artifacts she donated, Amidst papers and images of famous men is a small ivory miniature painted in watercolor, depicting a relative Blanche never met and knew almost nothing about, her grandmother, Sarah Brandon Moses. Sarah had died 30 years before Blanche was born and a mere 10 days after Blanche's father's third birthday. To be sure, Blanche knew scraps about Sarah's past. Sarah's father was clearly Abraham Rodriguez Brandon of Barbados, the island's wealthiest Jew. Yet despite being a meticulous family historian, Blanche drew an uncharacteristic blank for her grandmother's maternal line. Who was Sarah's mother? Moreover, why was so little known about her when she had married a man so famous? 
When it came to Sarah's early life, the documents typically cluttering Blanche's apartment were absent. Blanche was left to guess about Sarah's origins. Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, Barbados, Blanche scribbled in the margin of one paper, married Sarah Esther? Even Malcolm Stern, the premier genealogist of early American Jews, could do no better, speculating that she was part of the Lopez clan of Barbados. They were both wrong. Blanche and Malcolm were right about one small thing, though. Blanche's great-grandmother had been raised in the Lopez household in Barbados and sometimes used their last name. She did so because she was their slave. Blanche's grandmother, Sarah, too, had begun her life as a poor Christian slave in the late 18th century Lopez household in Barbados. Within 30 years, Sarah had reached the pinnacle of New York's wealthy Jewish elite. Whereas once her own kin had referred to her as mulatto, by 1820, New York census and the New York Jewish community had reclassified her as white. What makes this change all the more surprising is it wasn't a secret during Sarah's lifetime. Although a mystery to Sarah's granddaughter, granddaughter Blanche, Sarah's partial African ancestry was known by numerous people everywhere she lived. Sarah's ability to change her official designated race to white, despite this knowledge, tells us as much about the early history of race, how race was made in the Atlantic world, as it does about the lives of early American Jews. Today, the small portrait of Sarah Brandon Moses, along with that of her brother, Isaac Lopez Brandon, also born enslaved, is understood to be among the rarest items owned by the Historical Society, as they are the earliest known portraits of multiracial Jews. For over two centuries, the remarkable story of Sarah lay buried in archives across three continents. And were it not for a small random footnote about her brother's ancestry in the records of Barbados Nita Israel Synagogue, the cocoon of assumptions obscuring Sarah's past might have remained intact. Sarah and her brother would have forever remained the lesser known members of an illustrious family. But sometimes the people we know the least about turn out to be the most interesting. Before now, Sarah's story was largely hidden from history. Tonight, I'd like to use her miniature to unveil that past. In general, miniatures of early American Jews tend to have been used to illustrate the broadest brushstrokes of the biographies of famous early Jewish men and women. Scholars will say, this is Hyman Levy, as if somehow the portrait and the man were the same thing. Sometimes scholars have used them this way because the portraits of miniatures are not of the highest quality, such that they might not stand up to close or detailed analysis. However, even when early Jewish American portraits are made by famous miniaturists with great skill, such as this John Ramage 1789 portrait of Jacob de Leon, almost no attention is paid to the significance of the style. I'm gonna use Sarah's miniature tonight to suggest this is a mistake. Genre and technique not only matter, but are inextricably linked to the biography story the miniatures were designed to convey. In Sarah's case, her miniature was crucial to the racecraft of the era. And racecraft is a term I borrow from Karen and Barbara Fields. Distinct from race and racism, Racecraft does not refer to groups or to ideas about groups' traits. It refers instead to the mental terrain and to the pervasive belief. Unlike a physical terrain, racecraft originates not in nature, but in human action and imagination. Or in this case, in the artist's creative attempts to explain who Sarah was. As Karen and Barbara Fields emphasize, Racecraft is not a euphemistic substitution for racism. It's a kind of fingerprint evidence that racism has been on the scene. Racecraft impacted the lives not only of Jews with known African ancestry, like Sarah and Isaac, but all Jews. 
Sarah lived at the tipping point in discussion of Jews and race when Jews were increasingly seen in racial rather than religious terms. In the Caribbean, Jews often existed in a category between slave and free, between black and white, both in terms of their civil rights and their position in society. And we see an example of this in this uh, Benoit depiction from Suriname in which the Jewish shopkeeper is not only positioned among other people who are non-white in the colony, but is also shown to be analogous to them by having the same hand motions being used by the um, multiracial tailor and also the monkey in the corner. As colonial slave regimes crumbled, the categories of citizen and slave changed, as did how the body itself was invested by power relations. Back in Europe, novelists as well as racial scientists took up with the idea that Jews were not quite white. For racial scientists, the question was whether whiteness was equivalent to being Caucasian, a category to which Jews as a Semitic people could belong, or whether whiteness was restricted to the narrower category of Saxons or Aryans, both groups that explicitly excluded Jews. Travel writers, meanwhile, attacked Jews, particularly Sephardic Jews, for being swarthy or black. Novelists such as Thackeray likewise took up the trope of the Jew as somehow inherently interracial. For example, through the character of Miss Schwartz in Vanity Fair, whom Thackeray describes as, quote, a rich, woolly-haired mulatto from St. Kitts, whose father is a German Jew and whose mother was a slave. For Thackeray, this mixed heritage is a sign of, quote, Jewish degeneracy. And Miss Schwartz, whose name means black, is described as, quote, neither very bright nor very talented. Jews found themselves caught up in debates about where they belonged. Miniatures rebuked attempts to position Jews as something other than white by using strategies of racecraft. Between the 1790s and 1830s, ivory miniatures played a crucial role in the construction of Jewish families. Eventually, by the 1840s, silhouettes and daguerreotypes would replace miniatures as the small portrait of choice. But for nearly 40 years, miniatures held sway. In order to explain why miniatures were so useful to early American Jews, I'm going to take you through how Sarah's portrait was made and unveil the role of miniatures in creating Jewish families in the early 19th century. I argue that Jewish miniatures were interwoven with the four main practices of racecraft. That is, one, ideas that govern what goes with what and whom, such as sumptuary laws about dress. Two, how different people must deal with each other, such as rituals of deference and dominance. And three, where human kinship begins and ends, discussions of blood. And fourth and finally, how people look at themselves and each other, such as through the gaze. To make this argument, I rely on new methods for studying miniatures. My argument relies on digital humanities as much as early 19th century advice manuals for miniature makers. Advances in digital photography clarify how miniatures were made, allowing us to zoom in on the incredible skill required to place small specks of paint on the ivory surface. For Jewish patrons, this miniature art, I argue, had crucial ramifications for how all Jews, and particularly interracial Jews like Sarah, aimed to present themselves during an age when Jews' race was increasingly called into question. Although born in Barbados, although she was born in Barbados and died in New York, sometime around 1815 to 16, Sarah Rodriguez Brandon, a young West Indian heiress, found herself in London, having her portrait painted. Since Sarah's journey to the Portrait Makers Gallery was unusually difficult, it deserves an explanation before we turn to how her portrait was made. This journey reveals how deeply racecraft impacted Sarah's life before she even placed a toe inside the portrait studio. Sarah entered the London Portrait Studio a free woman. Yet when she came into the world in 1798, 
She was the fourth generation of women enslaved by the Lopez family of Barbados. Like most Bayesian Jews, the Lopez's lived in Bridgetown, near the synagogue along Swan Street. Although Sarah's mother eventually gained her freedom and even inherited property, she never legally gained her lover's last name. In fact, throughout her life, Sarah's mother's name varied. Sometimes her first name was Esther, and sometimes Sarah Esther. But tonight, I'm going to refer to her as Esther to differentiate her from her daughter. Esther's last name also varied in the early years between Lopez and Gil, the name of Esther's white father. Early on, Sarah and her mother didn't share a last name because Esther and Abraham Rodriguez Brandon never officially married. Although intermarriage between whites and people of African descent technically wasn't forbidden on the island, it wasn't done. Denying marriages between so-called whites and blacks or whites and mulattoes was helped, helped create racial binaries on the island. The church's unwillingness to sanction interracial marriages underscored that children produced from such alliances should not be considered real kin by their white fathers, as heirs typically had to be legitimate in order to inherit. Anglican church records, which also control taxes, the right to vote, the ability to serve in legislature, obsessively marked both race and legitimacy. Yet despite laws and social conventions that encouraged Sarah's father and grandfather not to consider their interracial offspring as blood kin, both men took the unusual step of recognizing their children and financially supporting them. When Sarah's mother Esther had to wait until, although Sarah's mother Esther had to wait until she was an adult and had borne at least three children before she could gain her freedom, Sarah herself was more fortunate. When she was only three, she stood before the church warden at St. Michael's Cathedral as her father Abraham Rodriguez Brandon paid for her manumission. Gaining her freedom was the first step on her path to the portrait maker's gallery. The second step to the London Gallery happened in 1811, when Sarah and her older brother Isaac traveled 500 nautical miles to the southeast to Suriname. Suriname was both in the wrong and the right direction. On the one hand, the boat took Sarah further south, away from the British Isles. On the other hand, once she arrived in Suriname, she was able to convert to Judaism. This rite of passage laid the groundwork for her transformation into her father's preferred heir. The records for the Barbadian and Surinamese synagogues clearly state that the journey was spiritual in nature. Sarah and her brother Isaac had come to Suriname to become Jews of the Portuguese nation, as Western Sephardic Jews were known. Although today Suriname's Jewish community is quite small, in the first part of the 19th century, Par Maribo, the main port, had one of the largest and wealthiest Jewish communities in the Americas. Suriname was also home to the first Afro-Jewish prayer group. And by the time Sarah landed in the beautiful port, approximately 10% of the city's Jewish community could claim African ancestry. When Sarah left Suriname, she was free and a Jew. This meant that along with her brother Isaac, Sarah was also her father Abraham Rodriguez Brandon's only Jewish children. Originally not a particularly notable Jew on the island, Abraham had established himself as an important member of the synagogue and a merchant and was on the road to becoming the island's wealthiest Jew. For merchants, children were an investment who could cement trade alliances with other Jewish merchant families. Hence, like most wealthy Jews, Abraham's vision was towards the future and the kind of match his children might make. Like the children of the Montefiores, the Barrows, and other, okay, I'm gonna see if we can get that to load again. Okay, it, there it goes. Like the children of the Montefiores, the Barrows, and other wealthy West Indian Jewish families, Sarah was sent to England to be educated. That education prepared her for marriage and helped strip away her identity as a former slave. In both England and the British colonies, education was a crucial marker of elite status during the 18th and 19th centuries. 
In the language of racecraft, education taught people rituals of deference and dominance, or how different people must deal with each other. Education trained elite males to govern themselves so that they could gather, govern others. Elite girls' education likewise prepared females to take their place in so-called polite society, including how to deal with servants and the Jewish poor. Beyond reading, writing, and arithmetic, elite girls learned dancing, music, sewing, as well as how to dress and undertake pious performances. Elite women were also expected to have been trained to run a large household and to pass on household management skills to their children. Sarah was learning how to deal with servants rather than be a servant. For Jews, being an elite also meant learning languages. Codes of difference and dominance were embedded in the way people spoke, and language and accent were key. Even the wealthiest Jews were tainted by association with the Jewish poor. Punch magazine, for example, made the accent of a ragman come out of the mouth of upperly mobile Benjamin Disraeli, a convert since childhood. Speaking the right way signaled one was meant to be part of the ruling elite, deserving of deference. Language was equally important for women. For non-Jews, education provided elite young women with a basic knowledge of French, which signified one's politeness. The goal was primarily pronunciation and accent rather than a true fluency. For elite young women, a rudimentary knowledge of Hebrew was similarly crucial. Equally important, Sephardic schools taught students how to ladinar, that is, to read the Pentateuch in the elegant Baroque Spanish used in many Western Sephardic prayer books. Western Sephardic Jews did not speak Ladino, the Judeo-Spanish used by Eastern Sephardim, but fluency in Spanish and or Portuguese was considered a crucial part of the Western Sephardic identity and was a prerequisite for Jewish educators in London and the colonies. And we see here, um, for example, the signature of Rachel de Castro on the inside of a first edition of the prayer book for Bevis Marx. The prayer book itself was in this elegant Spanish, but her inscription is in Portuguese. For a former slave and former Christian like Sarah, education was almost as crucial to her process of becoming a full member of the Jewish community as her conversion in Suriname. London was the perfect place for Sarah to learn how to become part of upper class Jewish society. And the lessons she learned there would help her when she came to New York. Education gave Sarah Jewish peers she could rely on in times of need and separated her from the Jewish poor attending the Jews' free school in the East End. Children from elite Jewish families like the Montefiores and the Rothschilds attended Hertz's Academy, shown on the left, and then Garcia's Sephardic-run school after it opened in 1815. Elite Barbadians from the Barro and Montefiore clan attended both institutions as did the later children of Abraham Rodriguez Brandon. A Sephardic woman named Hannah Gomez also run, ran a ladies' school for Jewish girls in rural Peckham, shown on the right. And we know that Sarah's much younger half-sisters boarded at Hannah Gomez's school and in Hanukkah of 1841 helped distribute meat and bread to seven poor families in the area. Their work was both generous and the Jewish equivalent of those pious performances required of non-Jewish gentlewomen. Although the records are lost from this earlier era, Sarah was probably introduced to Jewish British society through one of these specific elite schools. Like the Sephardic finishing school she attended, the miniature prepared Sarah to become the white of an Atlantic world Jewish elite. The portrait on ivory is the first and only glimpse we have of Sarah and perhaps the most crucial evidence of how she herself wanted to be seen. Miniatures were a key way Jews and other Europeans and Americans entered the marriage market. Ivory miniatures were frequently commissioned for engagements and weddings, but they also functioned as a sort of portable gift or tool in marriage negotiations. Miniatures could be sent across oceans or across town to help make a match. 
portraits mattered as they required the sitter's approval unless on some level presented the sitter as she or he wished to be seen. They are also deeply intimate, small and portable. They're meant for the eyes of the beloved. In her portrait, Sarah presents herself to her future husband as a fashionable yet modest British heiress, the appropriate bride for a wealthy New York Jew. She is captivating and precious. The materials and process used to make Sarah's portrait mark her as part of elite London culture and call to mind how far she had traveled since being born a slave. Sarah's portrait is small. It's only about two and three quarters by two and a quarter inches, but expensive. The ivory on which it was painted was cut from an elephant's tusk in slices less than a millimeter thick with attention to where the ivory's grain would run fine. The sheets were so thin, they were transparent, giving the miniature its unique qualities. Any scratches left by the saw were scraped off with a knife or a piece of glass, and then polished smooth using pumice or cuttlefish shell. The ivory would then be bleached, either by le being left in the sun or with the use of a hot iron. This gave the ivory a pale warm tint that mimicked the skin tones of elite Western Europeans. When combined with watercolor, the material gave the sitter's skin and clothes an almost magical translucent glow. This translucent glow came at a cost, however. The surface tension of ivory meant that the paint had to be applied by lightly scratching the surface with scrapers, hatching with parallel brush strokes, or stippling by layering and overlaying tiny dots of color to create changes in gradation of color and to avoid mudding the palette. Here we can see some examples of that dot technique, the stippling, and the hatching, the short parallel lines, on the Weston miniature from the Gibbs Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. And you can begin to see why the new technologies and digital photography are so important for the study of miniatures. This is a very small object. The material and skill required to make miniatures meant that good ones cost more than full-sized portraits in oil. Despite this cost, most Jewish portraits that remain from this era are miniatures. The process for making them was painstaking. Sarah's miniature would have required at least three sittings and relied on the sitter's access to leisure time, a strange commodity for a woman born a slave. Although some artists signed miniatures or would use a distinctive style, Sarah's portrait is anonymous. Despite this anonymity, you'll notice throughout the talk I referred to the artist as him. To be sure, there were female miniaturists, including Jewish women. Catherine Mendes de Costa, for example, was known for her portraits of family members. Her father, Dr. Fernandez Mendes, was the personal physician to King Charles II of England. And on the right, we can see her portrait of her son, Abraham. Even more unusual is her beguiling self-portrait on the left. That said, Catherine, like many female miniaturists, was an amateur. And chances are strong that the artist who made Sarah Rodriguez Brandon's miniature was a man. In the first sitting, the artist would have placed Sarah in a room with both strong light and shade. As the light fell directly on Sarah's face, the portrait maker would have outlined her face in pencil on drawing paper, then placed the paper below the translucent ivory so that it could be copied with a delicate brush using those short hatches or dots and a neutral shaded watercolor. And typically this pencil would be covered up by later paint, but in some instances, such as this detail from a portrait in the Museo del Prado, the underdrawing shows through. So you can see it here, particularly on little parts of her dress. Color would then have been placed on the ivory to create Sarah's pupils, and light shading, again in a neutral color, would have been used to mark her chin and neck, keeping her body's curves light and clear. Special attention would have been given to Sarah's eye and eyelid, and at this point I'd like to make a special shout out both to the head librarian, Susan Malvin of American Jewish Historical Society, and to Jennifer Rodewald of the Digital Media Lab at the Center for Jewish History for these incredible close-ups of Sarah's miniature.
I'm really grateful to them for having taken the time to make them. In the portrait, Sarah's large eyes hold ours. Her lips ba just barely turned up in the corners. Her smile is as enigmatic as that of a Greek koroi. The end result of her first sitting was light pearly flesh, typically outlined in India ink and lake, with light shading using vermilion and indigo. The pearly color of Sarah's skin in the miniature is no accident. Water watercolor miniatures and ivory are a genre dedicated to whiteness and bespeak a moment in Atlantic world history when race and skin color had become increasingly aligned with elite status. The translucent whitish tone of the ivory was used to create flesh tones and served as the base color for the skin as seen in a detail from this portrait of Sarah's brother Isaac. The forehead, the whites of the eyes, and the shiny area under the eyes all make use of unpainted ivory to create a glowing skin. Sometimes a sheet of silver leaf was even placed beneath the portions with skin in order to enhance the glow of whiteness, as seen in this example of a miniature, again, from the Museo del Prado. The alignment of whiteness and elite status may also explain why miniatures were so popular among Atlantic world Jews, precisely at the moment when their racial status had come into question with claims that Jews were, quote, too swarthy or black. Well, early on, some artists had tried using oil paints for ivory miniatures. They quickly found that oil paints tended to slip off of the ivory. Even when oil paints could be made to adhere with gum or glue, they obstructed the ivory's translucent glow. Watercolors, in contrast, allowed the sitter's skin to appear translucent and glowing. The watercolor on ivory technique was hard for miniatures to achieve for sitters with darker skin tones. Applying enough pigment to give the skin a darker tone meant that sitters were commonly left with a scratchy, rough appearance. This visible roughness is evident even in high quality portraits of interracial women from Suriname in the Rijksmuseum as seen on the left, and from early New York, now housed at New York Historical Society, the one on the right. Although this scratchiness was visible to the naked eye, details of the brush strokes highlight the problem. One strategy painters developed for showing darker skin on ivory was to use hatching, those short lines of painted paint crossed and overlapped to create a gradation in color. This was the same strategy that most miniatures used to get darker paint to adhere to the background of miniatures. While this strategy gave an appealing texture to fabrics, hair, and backdrops, it was rather disastrous for evoking the beauty of skin that didn't glow white. Indeed, painters who actively wanted to depict smooth, dark skin were more likely to use oil on canvas or pastels on paper. By the 1840s to 1850s, British miniaturists working among elites in India would perfect techniques for depicting a glowing, darker skin using the watercolors on ivory. But at this time Sarah's portrait was made, most artists' attempts to create darker skin tones on ivory ended up implying that somehow the skin itself was flawed. In the ivories from New York and Suriname, such as the portrait of a Surinamese girl in Mrs. Pierre Toussaint, the skin color of the sitter becomes marked in the language of the miniaturist in a way that, according to manuals from the day, was deemed masculine and hence undesirable for women. This is the work of racecraft in which, under the gaze of the painter, certain skin tones take on negative associations. As Karen Barbara Fields note, everyone has a skin color, but not everyone's skin color counts as race. In contrast to contemporary miniatures of women from whom the artist wanted to foreground African ancestry, Sarah Brandon's skin is marked as pearly and smooth. Indeed, if one were to judge only by the miniatures, both her skin and that of her brother were several shades lighter than that of her European father when he was painted in oil later in life. Either Sarah's skin was light enough not to require the techniques used by the other artists, or the painter decided to forego color for the sake of letting the ivory's natural glow exude through the paint. Regardless, what I would like to accentuate here is the genre itself 
idealized whiteness, and Sarah's portrait partakes or takes advantage of that reification. The first sitting would have taken less than an hour to ensure Sarah would not become fatigued, and her, as her relaxed muscles would cause the portrait to begin to look dull and languid. With the work completed, Sarah would once again be free, and the artist would move on to the second step, which did not require Sarah's participation or presence at all. Before the next sitting, the portrait painter would have worked on the sunset-like background with careful attention that the color harmonized with Sarah's dress and the color of, her, the, color of the flush of her face. As with the flesh, the fragile ivory gives the portrait's background a translucent romantic glow. The soft sunset of blues and pinks in the background sets off Sarah's luminous skin and the fabric's white folds. If he followed the sage advice of miniaturist manuals, the painter would have posed a figure wearing Sarah's white dress by the same window where he began her portrait so that the clothing could be painted while sparing Sarah the tediousness of too many sittings. As the subject of a well-made miniature, Sarah's time was deemed valuable. The choice of clothing was important. Like the use of ivory and the brush strokes used to create her skin tones, clothing was imbued with sumptuary codes about what goes with what and whom. Sarah's white dress with its delicate lace drew attention not only to the wearer's elegance, style, and purity, but also to her literal freedom from labor. Although Sarah's portrait is undated, the neckline, high waist, and sleeves date the dress to about 1815, when Sarah was 16 years old. As Sarah looks like she leapt from the pages of a Jane Austen novel, that's because she wears a neoclassical Regency-style white vertical gown, probably made of muslin or silk, fabrics favored for their ability to mimic the marble of classical sculpture. After a high waist that we see here, the gown would have had a long, narrow skirt that combined with the light material would have draped gracefully over her lower body and would have evoked the clinging draperies of antique statues. The neoclassical dress not only positioned Sarah as cultured, but also emphasized her freedom. In France, the style was first associated with the Revolution and with the Emperor Napoleon and his wife, the Empress Josephine, two figures linked in the minds of most Jews with Jewish emancipation. The dress also gendered Sarah in response to racial messages about Jewish women and women of mixed African descent. Although when the Regency style first appeared, its exposure of the body's lines was considered indelicate and shocking. By the time Sarah's portrait was made, the style was considered chaste, neat, and simple. Even though the shape of her breasts were often Oh, even though the shape of breasts were often emphasized in such dresses, and in evening versions, a fair amount of the back and bosom might be revealed. Sarah's dress also marks her portrait as indebted to West Indian notions of whiteness and how they're encoded in dress. Notably, Sarah's dress is more modest not only than that of the Empress, but also some of her North American Jewish counterparts, like Eliza Myers and Sarah Edding, who wore dresses of similar make that were lower cut and had bare shoulders or shorter sleeves. In fact, I have to say, having looked at a lot of early portraits of Jews, it's very hard to find women of Sarah's age wearing a dress that's that high as hers is. Usually you find that only on much older women from North America. Sarah's dress also contrasts with seductive depictions of Creole women. Sumptuary laws in the colonies often forbid enslaved women from fully covering their chests in order to emphasize the women's inability to govern their own bodies. In this context, the ability to cover the body more signaled greater freedom, not less. Sarah's portrait defies West Indian racial stereotypes and demurely covers her body. Once the painting of her clothing was completed, Sarah would have returned for her second sitting, in which all the colors would be applied to her face using those small stippling dots and extremely short lines. The artist followed the recommendation of guides of his day, avoiding gray and dark tints when depicting her face shading, lest they give her face that undesirable masculine appearance. This fear of manliness haunts the portrait made of the young Surinamese woman in the Rijksmuseum. 
the gray paint used to hint at darker skin tones cut two ways, as it also implied somehow her feminine virtues were wanting. Sarah's painter, in contrast, shades with lighter tones that emphasize Sarah's femininity, here aligned with whiteness. In the final sitting, every part of the miniature would be examined and perfected, starting with Sarah's hair. In the miniature, Sarah's curly brown hair is pulled back in a Grecian knot. Tendrils delicately frame her face. And notably, Sarah's hair is bare. She lacks the stylish tignon found in Portrait of a Surinamese Girl and Mrs. Pierre Toussaint, and numerous other portraits of free women of color. In certain colonies, free women of color were required to wear head wraps, but also co-opted them as a sign of cultural pride. Women of color in both Suriname and Barbados wore a distinctive style of head wrap, different from each other. And the portrait of Mrs. Pierre Toussaint suggests that stylish Afro-Caribbean women in early New York continued this practice. Like Sarah, Mrs. Toussaint was born a slave in the Caribbean, in her case in Haiti, but became free and wealthy in the United States. Unlike Sarah, she continued to have strong ties to New York's African-American community. In addition to being the wife of a famous hairdresser, she started a school for African-American children in the city. Sarah's unadorned hair signals her single status in Jewish religion and highlights her racial ambiguity by not signaling a clear allegiance to styles worn primarily by women of color. The neatness of Sarah's hair is equally crucial. By the early 19th century, racial scientists increasingly insisted that Jews, quote, black curly hair, along with their, quote, brown skin color, revealed their lingering oriental origins. Indeed, caricatures from this era used out of control hair to undermine claims that Jews could govern their bodies and hence take part in politics. For Jewish women, unruly hair took on more sexual associations. In anti-Semitic works such as Pierre Jacques Benoit's depiction of five enslaved women going to various places of worship in Suriname, Jewishness is equated with loose and revealing clothing and hair that will not be restrained. The women are from left to right, a Moravian, a Calvinist, a young Christian going to church on a holiday, a Jew and a Lutheran. The Jewish woman is the only one whose hair creeps down her back, escaping completely from the tignon. Loose hair, licentiousness, and Jewish practice became intertwined in the visual language of the drawing. In contrast, Sarah's neoclassically styled hair emphasizes her restraint and aligns her with Greco-Roman tradition increasingly associated with whiteness. Hair completed, white would have been added to Sarah's eyes and the darkest portion of her eyelids highlighting their impact. Eyes were crucial to the language of miniatures. Often, as in the case of Sarah's portrait or in Pierre Henri's portrait of the artist's family, eyes and miniatures seem neotenic, that is, they look the size and shape that you'd expect on a child, not an adult. They seem too large for the face. Like popular miniatures of lovers' eyes, the oversized eyes of Sears' portrait draw us in with intimacy, but the right kind of intimacy. The young Jewish's deep-set, almond-shaped eyes gaze back at the beholder, holding the viewer close. Sarah's eyes are larger than life. The largeness of Sarah's eyes make her appear younger than she actually was, innocent and vulnerable. The delicate intimacy of her gaze is crucial to the genre of miniatures and to Sarah's portrait. The portrait was now done. Sarah and her father would not have seen the completed version until it was encased under glass, giving it a polished look. Once completed, her portrait was ready to find its companion. And in 1817, Sarah and her portrait did just that. Sarah met a young New York Jew, Joshua Moses, who was in London on business, a man with a portrait of his own. And the match was a success. On March 19, 1817, the distinguished and learned Hacham Rafael Mandola married Sarah Rodriguez Brandon and Joshua Moses 
at London's Portuguese synagogue, Bevis Marks. Although Reina isn't mentioned, Joshua's father, Isaac Moses, was present, as well as several esteemed witnesses from the congregation, including Jacob Israel Brandon, the congregation's presidente, and his wife. On Sarah's side, Mr. Messiah and Mrs. Lindo, important members of the Bevis Marks with connections to Barbados, attended the marriage. Sarah brought more than a miniature to the wedding. Her father provided a 10,000 pound dowry with roughly $30 million worth of purchasing power today. Within a year of the marriage and before her first child was born, Sarah had followed her new husband to New York, where she would spend the final third of her life. Joshua brought a house near that of his parents on the lower tip of Manhattan, and Sarah settled into New York Jewish life. Sarah benefited from the new kin network she joined. Like Isaac Moses before him, Sarah's brother-in-law was the Parnas, or president, of Congregation Cherith Israel. Like his brother, Joshua became a voting member of the congregation, and he made sure his wife had a seat in the balcony to call her own. When Sarah's mother Esther and her brother Isaac joined her in New York from Barbados, the Moses family smoothed the way into Jewish high society. Sarah's brother Isaac became Joshua's business partner and married Joshua's sister Lavinia. And as you can see, they brought a house just down the street. When Sarah's mother Esther died in a March blizzard in 1823, apparently this has been going on for a long time, no one questioned her right to be buried in Sheriff Israel Cemetery. Once denied voting rights in Barbados because of his African ancestry, Isaac Lopez Brandon was welcomed as a full member of Sheriff Israel with a seat adjacent to the congregation's president. Records suggest that connections to the Moses clan helped Sarah and her brother become categorized as white in the New York and US records. In 1820, the census taker classified Sarah and her young children as white, the default category into which Jews in New York fell at the time. Unlike in Barbados, Suriname, Jamaica, and Curaçao, where censuses of militia sometimes separated Jews into a category between whites and blacks, Jews in New York faced prejudice, but not the same degree of racial uncertainty found in parts of the Caribbean. Sarah's London marriage also protected her. As the wealthy, fair-skinned wife of a white man, Sarah was parsed as white by the census taker. It's also possible Sarah's early years in slavery didn't matter as much as they would have in other places. Prior to 1850, the criteria for what race people belonged to varied by state. And before 1920, there was no one-drop rule for all the censuses. In 1820 New York, race was in the eyes of the census taker, and as such, at least for people who were racially ambiguous, was fairly arbitrary. What wasn't arbitrary, however, was the US law forbidding citizens, sorry, forbidding immigrants with African ancestry from becoming citizens. Yet, in 1829, Sarah's brother Isaac Lopez Brandon petitioned and received citizenship with God and his brother-in-law Moses L. Moses as witnesses. Marrying a Jew from New York changed the destiny that would have awaited Sarah had she returned to Barbados, or had she married a man from other parts of the United States. Even after Sarah's death, whiteness was defined in Barbados as the absolute absence of any African ancestor. No matter how wealthy or how ivory pale Sarah and her children might have looked, they would have been classified as colored or mulatto had they still lived on the island. And notably, even after Isaac was classified as white in New York, anytime he went back to Barbados on business, which he did regularly, he returned to that colored classification on the island. Likewise, if Sarah had married one of the prominent Jewish men from New Orleans and lived there, she would have faced the one drop rule of race that was used in that state. It wasn't that early New York wasn't racist, to be absolutely clear. City officials just defined the color line differently. Sarah died in 1828, just before she turned 30, and shortly after the birth of her ninth child. Less than a decade later, her husband Joshua followed her to the grave. 
Their children continue to live with Risha Moses, Joshua's older sister, and her uncle husband, Aaron Levy, who you will remember, people who were last time, they didn't have any kids of their own. Don't marry your uncle, who's also your cousin. <laughs> Sarah's children would benefit from the way travel, money, and match made through portraits had reshaped their mother's world. Sarah's sons would serve in the white militia of the US Army in both the Mexican-American and Civil Wars. And her son Israel would become the first child of a former slave to graduate from Columbia Medical School, albeit unbeknownst to his teachers. <laughs> Another of Sarah's sons would serve as president of Sheriff Israel, and her third to last child, Lionel, on the right, would marry Selena, the granddaughter of Reverend Gershom Mendes Satius. It was Selena and Lionel's daughter, Blanche, who would one day donate Sarah's miniature to American Jewish Historical Society. It isn't surprising that Blanche knew little about Sarah. Even Lionel had barely a chance to know his mother before she died. When Blanche looked at Sarah's miniature, she saw only its glowing ivory whiteness. The role the ivory had played in marking Sarah as white was no longer visible. In this talk, I've chosen to focus on an object owned by an early Jewish who moved to New York for marriage. Like the first talk, the object that Jewish owned, an ivory portrait, played a role in cementing her to her new kin. Of the three talks in this series, my discussion of Sarah's portrait in ivory comes in the middle. Her marriage falls between Jews who married yoke mates and those who married soul mates. That is between Raina Levy Moses, whose marriage bound together two merchant houses, and Sarah Ann Hayes Mordecai, who married for love without a dowry or even her parents' prior permission. Last week I mentioned that changes in marriage also brought about changes in kinship, or two weeks ago, where women became more connected to their new husband's family than that of their blood relations. Sarah's story lies somewhere between these two extremes. On the one hand, like Raina, Sarah's marriage brought together two major traders, Isaac Moses of New York and Abraham Rodriguez Brandon of Barbados. And the match clearly benefited both Joshua and Isaac Moses. Joshua and Isaac Moses gained an enduring connection with the lucrative southern sugar markets. Yet the match also helped build the Rodriguez Brandon empire. New York was quickly becoming a crucial trade center and Joshua's father, Isaac Moses, was one of New York's key Jewish merchants. Sarah's phenomenally large dowry reflects her father's desire to use her marriage to guarantee a lineage for himself through a female line. On the other hand, Sarah's marriage reveals something new. The kin she gained through her marriage reshaped who she and her children would be. Despite her father's overtures and love, it would be the Moses clan that defined her post-marriage life. Sarah's portrait is part of the new courtship rituals that came into being as romantic love took root. The miniature's intimate gaze attests to the power of the new world of love and stronger bonds to one's husband's family that came alongside it. As Sarah's portrait speaks to the shifting landscape of marriage, her portrait also teaches us something about race. Most stories about racial shift from this era have been told under the category of passing. That is, when somebody categorizes a certain race, leaves behind their past, and somehow pretends to be, uh, belong to another racial group. The idea of passing suggests somehow someone is a certain race. For example, Sarah somehow really was, quote, colored, as her childhood records in Barbados proclaimed, and not white, as she was labeled in the New York census. Yet pretending was never an option for either Sarah or her brother. Everywhere they lived, they lived among other Barbadian immigrants aware of their early lives as slaves. New York was no different. Sarah's husband Joshua and his brothers had been schoolmates with the grandchildren of Sarah's former owner. Sarah wasn't pretending to be white. Whiteness itself had changed, and she had changed alongside it. Sarah's portrait also reminds us of the role racecraft played in the creation of early American Jewish families. At the opening of the lecture, I noted racecraft includes ideas about what and whom and how different people must deal with each other, where human kinship begins and ends, 
and how people look at themselves and each other. Jewish law, like science, rejects race as a real category. A Jew is a Jew, and there is no such thing as Jewish DNA, despite what DNA genealogy tests seem to suggest. Yet early American Jews found themselves in dialogue with how other people in the colonies constructed race. Stepping back and looking at how objects help Jews create family stories about whiteness helps underscore the way race was crafted in early America. Thinking about how racecraft in the past impacted family history can also remind us how we continue to craft race with our own categories and genealogical pursuits. Speaking of Sarah and her mother as multiracial or interracial suggests that her father, Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, was not, merely because he was accepted as white and all his known ancestors were Sephardic. Yet by the time Abraham's family fled Iberia, it was a rare new Christian family that hadn't married non-Jews at some point in their history. Moreover, if DNA tests reveal anything, they show that various groups of Jews, such as Jews from Iberia or Germany or Russia, differ from each other because they resemble in part the communities of people they live among, sharing DNA due to conversion, intermarriage, and illicit sexual encounters. Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, like all Jews alive today, was just as interracial as Sarah was. We just choose to believe the story of him being a pure Sephardi and not to mark him that way, or perhaps ourselves. The myth of pure races is part of the work of racecraft. Portraits like Sarah's played a crucial role in negotiating connections across oceans. They also helped present Jews as part of the Atlantic world elite to which they aspired, an elite which increasingly insisted upon whiteness. Thank you. glad the lights came back on. I was getting a little worried there. That I doesn't have to speak in the dark. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, I want to um, begin by, um, besides saying what a wonderful talk it was and how much I learned, and uh, really uh, kind of eye-opening, I want to um, thank Laura Liebman for inviting me to speak here, and Laura Minsky for making all the arrangements, and you all for coming back when, uh, uh, despite last week's snow. So I have a double challenge here. Uh, the first one is that I only have 10 minutes to comment, and I would like to spend hours discussing this. Um, the second challenge is that I am not a visual person, and I wrote down here, visualist, if that is such a word. I, I'm an Americanist, but I'm not a visualist. Um, in my um, writings, my published works, I have occasional references here and there to things, but they are far, few and far between. I never use slides or PowerPoint. Uh, before uh, lectures, when I'm asked, uh, do I need AV, I say, no, I don't uh, uh, use that. I rely on words. And um, now, more than that, I tend to put things um, um, on a somewhat uh, lower level than action. Um, I, uh, one of my, uh, my, one of my recent books um, was on um, Jewish peddlers, and I was interested in, um, and although their lives and livelihoods were about things, okay, um, eyeglasses, mirrors, uh, uh, shoes, needles, thread, uh, pictures, picture frames. Um, I glided over those things in my book. Um, I certainly, I didn't describe them. I didn't ponder what they looked like, um, how their materiality shaped their encounters, the encounters between customers and um, peddlers. Okay, and um, uh, I will never do that again. <laughs> okay, so reading this paper forced me to think much more seriously about the things, about things in general, how they were made, why they were made, why they were made the way they were, how their shape, volume, co um, color, uh, materiality, the conditions under which um, one mode of production uh, takes place as opposed to another, not only matter, 
Okay, but they actually drive history. And uh, again, I'm very grateful for the uh, being chided and pushed um, to rethink my own scholarship. And I'm already clanging around the next project that might be much more thing oriented. <clears throat> So uh, Laura Liebman more than uh, convincing, convincingly offers us here an intellectually and visually compelling journey uh, into the past. Her portrait in ivory is, provocative, is a provocative way in which she accomplishes um, a number of ends. And I want to first list what I think are some of the great accomplishments here. So first, it allows us, it allows her she, uh, to chart the complex, fluid, and physical journey of, uh, and flexible, I'm sorry, flexible journey of Jews into, around, and out of the Caribbean or around the Atlantic world. Um, it is a, a piece of work that takes Jews geography, place, physical mobility very seriously. And when we say early American Jews, what do we mean by that? But these are people who've lived in multiple places and in each place, uh, no doubt, um, their behaviors and their understanding of the world, their racecraft, um, is shaped by um, almost like a rolling stone, which uh, does gather moss. Uh, each place that they were leaves something on them. Um, this project also allows the author to ch chart the complex, fluid, and flexible journey of Jews into respectability, acceptability, and integration within, num within a number of interlocking, um, separate but interlocking um, social groupings based on class, geography, and perceived placement in the coded world, color-coded worlds um, they inhabited. It allows her to show that the binary between freedom and slavery existed with a number of potential permutations that always didn't always lead to inevitable outcomes, um, or at least at this particular moment in time. I think this would be a very different story if we were thinking 10 years later or 20 years later um, and when the um, uh, reality of freedom or slavery became much more uh, rigidly um, uh, um, uh, polarized. Um, this paper allows her to show how gender with linked issues of marriage and sexuality, color, religion, and class, complicated issues of uh, freedom and enslavement. And it allowed her to show that the very definition of Jewish was, and I love the ending so much, no doubt is, itself porous, and that uh, references to something or someone as Jewish Okay, um, uh, in quotes almost, uh, provides us as the analysts with wrinkles and complexities um, that um, we should have always taken cognizance of. And it's not enough to say so-and-so was Jewish, okay, but rather um, to think of this as um, a process uh, that was ongoing. Um, as such, this was a tantalizing and wonderful example of the reality that white and black Jewish and not Jewish functioned less as rigid opposites, but as uh, perceived reference uh, to each other, historically and geographically contingent. Uh, so too in this new world uh, to which Sarah, who started her life as a poor Christian enslaved um, a woman, ended up Jewish, well off, um, associated with um, some of the uh, uh, wealthiest um, people around her, and free, um, as free as a woman could be, um, is a compelling story. And um, it uh, uh, also, as a final accomplishment here, it forces me as a historian to consider, in fact, um, things in a much less fleeting and superficial way. I'm no longer going to just mention the thing and then move on. So some of the fluidity of identity, uh, which has been charted, it is also notable that um, some of this fluidity of identity, which has been chartered by historians of race, slavery, the Caribbean, and parts of British North America previously, had not been uh, uh, associated with Jewish history. And uh, that is, this is not new. I mean, in the last 20 years, maybe more, historians have been doing this uh, uh, um, kind of 
charting of fluidity. And I think uh, Laura Liebman is now making this, um, going to tell us that within Jewish history we have to do this as well. It is the emerging consensus among scholars of the period before the mid-19th century that multiple navigable, navigable paths existed for individuals to redefine themselves and be, redefi be redefined as circumstances changed around them. Um, those, cha those changes involve their own agency and also the contingency of historic uh, conditions. So what Laura Liebman has done here is thrown into the analytic hopper of the Jewish issue. And um, I hope that scholars of uh, racial navigation, racial hybridity, race craft, which is obviously a wonderful world, will now take cognizance of this project and um, see that uh, Jews went uh, through this as well. Now, so for all of my praise, I do have, these are not criticisms, but questions, okay, and really they're questions. How much one is left to ponder to the fact that she had been enslaved by a Jewish family add to her life chances? Can uh, Laura Liebman match up Sarah's story with that of other enslaved women of mixed white African derivation who also journeyed to whiteness, but who did so without the Jewish connection? Uh, that is, in a place, let's say, like New Orleans, where Catholicism provided something of a um, safety net uh, for the enslaved, um, were there times, places where, uh, or times uh, in the history of uh, New Orleans um, that religion, that Catholicism allowed slaves a way uh, out? Did all the places within this large Caribbean world operate the same? That is, the Caribbean, we've Again, think of this as the Caribbean, but yet remember this is British, French, Spanish, Dutch, uh, Portuguese. How much were Sarah's uh, chances to end her life rich and white reflect uh, the British realities around her? Would she have had the same story in the uh, French or the Spanish or the Dutch um, context? Um, there were, for example, rich, um, and I wanted to say something, which because New Orleans came up here, and I just was recently at a conference in New Orleans, but there were, for example, a number of rich slave-owning Jews, Jews, Jewish families in French-ruled New Orleans, um, even under the Code Noir, which specified that no Jew could live there. Um, um, so did the fact that um, Sarah's uh, family exists within the British uh, context give them a certain um, breathing room on the uh, 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 racial um, uh, categories that wouldn't have happened in New Orleans where in fact Jews were really not allowed to be there but did anyhow. So uh, did being in the British world give uh, the owner and the enslaved more, some extra freedom or to use a very scientific term, wiggle room, uh, to navigate race. Um, how did the British Caribbean world resemble, resemble or not British North America? Could a Sarah have made that same trans transition there? Had she started, so she starts out in Barbados, goes to England, then ends up her life at the kind of top of New York. What if she had been a slave in New York at the beginning? could she have made that same uh, journey? Um, and I was really curious, um, although Sarah comes to New York at the very tail end of slavery uh, in New York, um, certainly there were recently emancipated slaves in New York. Did she have sla former slaves working in her home? And how did that uh, uh, impact the way in which she managed them? Since presumably in her um, school, she learned uh, how to manage uh, domestic help. Um, um, what were the details surrounding um, uh, Sarah's conversion? And uh, Laura Liebman tells us, you know, that uh, the minutes say it was through a kind of faith or through a, a discovery, but. I wonder if that's the case. Okay, um, uh, who converted her? Uh, when? Where? What did she have to uh, go through in order to experience that conversion? Um, when she, you know, it is said she did it because she believed. She and her brother believed. How was this tested? I, I really would have loved to know. Now, it's no doubt that the sources don't tell us, and it's just a fantasy that we could know this. Um, and, you know, how did conversion happen in that place versus elsewhere in the world, um, including uh, those she did and would live in? 
I would also like Laura Liebman to do more with the racial placement of Jews in the Caribbean and early American world. While she tells us that Jews got caught up in the debates over placement in racecraft, did their placement operate as a force to deprive them of freedom, ever depri um, deprive them of their freedom over their bodies and their <laughs> destinies? Um, Jews were not Christians in a Christian world, yes, and we, in a sense, have to assume that they were, to some, reason, to some degree, disabled by not being Christians in this Christian world. Um, um, and they experience these disabilities um, as other non-Christians, or frankly, as non-adherents to the faith, to the official faith tradition. So, um, in a place like Barbados, Catholics were much more uh, on the uh, uh, um, sort of out. Uh, of the, uh, had uh, um, dramatically fewer um, rights. Um, so, um, uh, um, so we have that reality here. We know that individuals, and we have some nice examples here, uh, Thackeray and others commented upon this or that about the Jews, including their fa their physical attributes. Um, but did their level of a perceived physical differentness um, and the degree to which it functioned as a matter of public discussion um, ever put them in the category, which is really crucial here, of enslavable. In other words, did being defined as having unruly hair or unruly, person, unruly personalities um, ever uh, jeopardize their status of freedom? And we, I think we know the answer is no. And so I think the language of, of race and racecraft has to be made much more complex when thinking about Jews in this. Clearly, they never found themselves in a situation where someone could own them literally brand them, and I think that's a really powerful matter. Um, and notably, in certainly in North America, in this period, baptism to uh, Christianity was not a ticket out of slavery. Okay? And a slave who got baptized remained a slave. Okay, it's also important to note that while Laura Liebman refers to race science as an emerging intellectual and political force that raised questions about the Jews, I think um, as a science, it actually takes pl it develops a bit later than, than this period, um, probably well after Sarah and her, as a science, um, after Sarah and her peers had departed the scene. It was much more a late 19th century phenomenon, and indeed the uh, category of race as a fixed um, uh, matter emerges um, beyond uh, this story. This is a story really about the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, bef um, where um, fluidity about race um, partly growing out of the Enlightenment and the idea of mutability was still very much uh, a sort of intellectual contrast. Now, finally, I want to say something about the miniatures, which I just absolutely loved um, as a, a reader. That was just amazing. So she says, between 1790 and the 1830s, and this is a quote, ivory miniatures played a crucial part in the construction of Jewish families. Reading this, my non-material cultural historical antennae began to buzz. Did they play a role more than other material objects? Did they play a, more of a role in Jewish families than other wealthy families? Was this a distinctively Jewish material uh, uh, genre? Um, and I was trying to think of analogy, an analogy, and the one which is really a quite silly one, but um, some of the people who've written about uh, post-World War II American, middle-class American Jews in their uh, domestic interiors talk about um, how Jews are so contested concerned with slip cover, plastic slip covers <laughs> on their furniture, and somebody without any scientific basis said, if you went into a home and you saw plastic slip covers, you knew they were Jewish. Okay, so did miniatures play that same role? Now again, I presume not, but I'd really like to know about the broader uh, diffusion of uh, miniatures, and is it really a Jewish story? Laura Liebman does wonderful work here describing how a miniature made, and I was really awestruck by it. But I wondered if they existed in the spectrum of cost and craftsmanship. Um, who, how many miniaturists were there in London? Did her 
father shop around to find a particular miniaturist? Did she decide or did he decide who they were going to use? Um, did she decide or did he decide how many sittings she would have? Um, she also tells us much about the miniatures, but frankly, much of what, what um, we get about them exists in the realm of speculation. And that may be just because of what material culture does as a historical um, uh, document. Um, so, and here's Laura um, Liebman, quote, in an era in which some Jews still arranged marriages, miniatures could have been sent across oceans. So needless to say, I wanted to know, were they and how were they sent? Um, or um, she tells us the miniature is, quote, the most crucial evidence of how she wanted to be seen. So do we know that? Uh, did she get to vet it? Uh, did uh, she get an example, you know, that's sort of a first draft and say, I don't like it, that's not how I want to be seen, and um, asked to have it um, touched up or changed? Um, or was her father in charge of the process uh, because he's, after all, paying the bill? And um, if this is to get her onto the marriage market, uh, she has to be, uh, you know, he wants it to look. So I want to know what's her input into this uh, process. So again, did she get to vet it? Did her father, uh, who presumably paid for it, or was it one in which uh, once contracted, the customer was stuck with it? Um, did she like it? Okay. Um, were they, as Laura Liebman tells us, quote, meant for the eyes of the beloved? I thought it was a beautiful phrase, but then I thought maybe they were first meant for the eyes of her um, father, okay, and um, and or maybe they were meant for the eyes of his father. Uh, that is, did he have to send it to them uh, before they uh, uh, um, decided on her? Or maybe not this miniature, but others where they passed around like photos on Match.com. Okay, um, and uh, that is a number of potential spouses may have gawked at them, and then one of the most smitten or the highest bidder got the girl. Uh, did Sarah's father instruct the miniaturist to make her whiter than she really was? Did the miniaturist he chose, since I'm going to presume he did it, um, not Sarah, have a reputation for being a good trusty whitener? So finally, in all of this, who had the agency, who decided, who did the positioning of the face, the body, the person, and into which category? After all, for all of its fluidity, to not be white, however perceived, and whatever words were used, meant to be potentially or likely a piece of property, to be bought and sold, to be used against one's will. And here I come back to the Jewish issue. In this world, um, Jews um, could, in the end, not be bought or sold. Um, they did the buying and the selling. So these questions aside, I think this is a wonderful example, um, contrary to my wordiness, um, which has um, uh, now um, converted me a bit. And I might say, I'll end it on an extremely trite note, which is say, an ivory uh, miniature may be worth a thousand words. so much, Hasia. I don't know that I'll get to all those questions, but I'll, we can talk later if, if not. Um, I, a lot of those questions I think are really important in terms of, and things that I've struggled with with this project in terms of how to think about race and Jews, and then also the question of agency keeps on coming back to haunt me. Um, so I, Sarah's both part of this series, but I'm also writing a separate book about her and her brother. So I've been thinking a lot about them in terms of their larger trajectory. And I, you know, one basic thing is we don't know a huge amount about who um, got to have the final say in terms of the miniature. And, but certainly people did reject miniatures and say that they didn't find them to be acceptable likenesses. And I have to say, some of the time when I look at the miniatures, for example, from the one that I showed from New York Historical Society, I'm like, I don't get it. Why didn't she reject that miniature? Because it seems so not flattering as a miniature. So um, clearly, 
sometimes I would have rejected it if I were the person and they were fine with it. So, um, so I think there is that issue. One of the things that I think is quite interesting is how different in quality the miniature is that Sarah and her brother have made as opposed to the one that exists still in a family collection of her father from about um, 25 years earlier, which is a much less well-made miniature and presumably didn't cost nearly as much. And I think it really says something about how much he was able to pay a miniature maker in terms of having the cream of London be available to make the miniature. Um, I've certainly gotten in heated discussions with people about the quality of early Sephardic miniatures. For example, the ones that I showed by the woman whose father had been the, the physician for King Charles II. And somebody was disparaging how well they, how they were made. And I was like, you have no idea. You've never seen some of the really bad miniatures from the colonies. You know, so there's, it's something important about going to London and being able to have access to just a much wider range of miniature makers in terms of quality that there's a whole school of miniature makers that um, in London that are just much more skilled. And you do get people traveling um, to Suriname and to other places and to New York to make miniatures. Um, but th there is a kind of gap in quality. So I think it's very important that it actually gets made in London itself. Um, so I, I put that out there. So that's one issue. Uh, and I'll kind of circle back to some of your questions earlier on about what difference does it matter that she was born into a Jewish slaveholding family? And fortunately, one of the things that, um, uh, fortuitously because of a number of different granting agencies, I was able to spend a lot of time in Barbados going through the records. And one of the things that came out of that work was not only being able to trace her slave ancestry, but really getting a larger sense of the community of people who were of partial Jewish descent and partial African descent and partial British descent, who lived in and among the Jewish community, but either became part of it or didn't. And she's very unusual for becoming part of that Jewish community. And that's really only because she goes to Suriname. So people could not get converted in Barbados, whereas in Suriname, it was much more likely to be converted. And I, whether that's because earlier on, Suriname is a Dutch colony, I don't know, because honestly, that's true in Suriname, but not true in Curaçao, which is another Dutch colony. So your point about the specificity of different Caribbean places is so crucial for our work for the Caribbean. For example, just even the definition of whiteness is so different from place to place in the Caribbean. In Jamaica, if you have seven of your eight uh, great-grandparents are white, then you're white. But in Barbados, you would not be. In Suriname, you might be or you might not, depending on if your parents had legally married. So, and if your parents legally married, retroactively, your racial status would change. So again, very different on place. And I'm not even sure it's a Dutch versus British issue, but really just so much embedded in local histories and how things develop and the difference between sugar colonies and between trading stations and all different sorts of things. So um, Caribbean, super complicated. Um, but I, I do think that it is important her starting off there as opposed to in New York, just in terms of the number of people who come from mixed backgrounds. Um, and again, even though I've tried to problematize that idea, but come from, um, have parents who are enslaved, but also parents in the Jewish community that is just so much more prevalent in Barbados than it is in New York at the time that it really is a different story. So I, I have a hard time imagining her starting off in New York and having the same sort of trajectory. But it's an interesting question. If I come up with somebody like that, I'll let you know. Um, the other thing uh, that you asked about was whether there were other people that came to what happened in terms of going to England and whether that part of it was a Jewish story. Um, certainly there, early on, um, somebody who's in the early 19th century 
writing letters back from Barbados, a woman who's come from England, points out that she doesn't understand why people put up with the racial prejudice in Barbados the way that they do. Because if people would just move to England, they would have been considered white. And we do know that a number of people took that avenue or path towards whiteness. Descendants of the Montefiore clan, for example, um, went to England and became basically just part of the white establishment um, as long as they didn't go back to the island. Um, so I, I do think that there's part of that going on. What for me ends up being really important for thinking about the miniatures and the Jewishness on some level it does relate back to this, um, you were asking about that moment when these become a Jewish thing. It is really important, I think, sure, every, there is this push towards romantic love of which miniatures um, are playing a part in marriage trades and getting people's interest in your marriage partner. But um, there has been a long discussion on the criticism on miniatures for, by Jews of say like, there's nothing really Jewish here. Like they just look like everybody else. And for me, that's actually really important for this moment in Jewish history, that this is a moment where particularly in the Caribbean, P Jews are petitioning for civil rights and to have portraits that style themselves according to looking like the elites like everybody else as opposed to the way that they're being depicted in anti-Semitic caricatures is really important. So it's not just that Jews look like everybody else, but that's kind of the purpose of these portraits, right, is to make that argument about the self. We are part of the elite establishment. And in that sense, I think, um, the discussion about, I think your caution about Jews and race is an important one in terms of um, certainly the people who were slaves who were also Jewish, of which there are a fair number, for example, in Suriname, it's not because they're Jewish, it's because they have a female ancestor going back who happened to have been enslaved. So, um, and because they had ancestors coming from Africa. So I think that is a really important distinction to make. Um, what ends up being important for me in terms of Jews and race for this moment is not um, that Jews are being biased against, but that they seem to be responding against the fear of it. Does that make sense? So um, there is this moment where Jews in Barbados and in, and in Jamaica get the right to vote at exactly the same moment as free people of color. And so it's under this guise of the brown privilege bills. And um, you see this sort of moment where Jews are, in some sense, responding against both anti-Semitism, but also in dialogue with other racialized depictions. So for me, it's more about the responses by Jews and the way that they're constantly framing their relationship to race in dialogue with African Americans in the colonies as opposed to that somehow they were going to be mass, in mass characterized in New York and being put on a different part of the census and denied, right? So I don't know if that helps in terms of that difference, but um, for me, that's kind of part of what's going on during this time period. Um, one last final thing. Um, in terms of the racial science, I totally agree that there's this moment later I think we haven't been as good in terms of mapping out the way the Enlightenment um, discussions about race impacted how Jews are responding in terms of their dress and their portraitures early on. Um, so we can, I can sort of go through the people that I'm interested in from the sort of 1780s, 1790s onward into this time period. But I do think it's really important as Jews are getting given emancipation by Napoleon and as it's sort of floating around Europe and then comes to the colonies, that there ends up being a kind of backlash against that in terms of discussions about Jews and race, both in terms of what we would think of as pseudoscientific, they would have thought as scientific writings, but in, in terms of portraiture. So that I think also, as you said, is very much something that people in African and Caribbean studies have thought about a lot in terms of um, as you emancipate a people, either by giving them civil rights or by giving them freedom, that there has been this historically a tendency to then pull the rug out from underneath the people at the same time and to say, 
oh, it wasn't just based on something that you could change, now it's actually something inherently in it. So that's where I think thinking about this early time period and that sort of transatlantic moment um, changes some of the discussion from the United States where we're so focused on the Civil War and legacies of slavery as being much later um, in terms of racial politics. So that, I'll end there. But thank you incredibly much for your comments, Hasia. I know everybody for coming.